Hello everyone, I'm Deacon Pedro, and welcome back to our continued series during this time of pandemic, Faith in a Time of Crisis. Today I'm very happy to be joined by Archbishop Murray Chatlin. He's the Archbishop of the Northern Diocese of Kuwaitan Lipa, a diocese that encompasses parts of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Archbishop Chatlin, it's so good to have you here with us. Thank you, Deacon Pedro. Good to be with you. It's good to see you. We never get to see you because you're so far away. So this is a good excuse. It's expensive travel to get to our north here. So uh, it's a good opportunity for us to uh, connect. It is. Now, for people that are not familiar with uh, your archdiocese, can you give us a little bit of a sense of what uh, the dimensions is like 42,000 square kilometers? How many Catholics? How many parishes? Sure. Uh, so uh, it's the Archdiocese of Kuwaitan, La Paz. Kuwaitan is a Cree word that means north. So that's who we are. We're in the northern part of Saskatchewan and Manitoba provinces. We're about 430,000 square kilometers, which is over half the size of the country of France. Uh, we have about 50 communities, quite small, isolated, spread out over all this area. 14 of our communities have no roads in normally, only ice roads in the winter. So uh, those are difficult to sort of get in and out of and expensive to service. And so, but that's part of our, our reality up north. I live in the Paw, so I normally am traveling 80% of the time to 50% of the time. But obviously COVID has had an effect on that. If I go to Laloche, our furthest west side, it's about an eight and a half hour drive. If I go towards our, our east side, it's about eight hour drive. So you get a sense of just how wide and north uh, our diocese goes. Absolutely. Now, how many, you said uh, some 50 communities, is that parishes? Yeah, about, yeah, we would have churches in 50 communities, the parishes. Uh, we, we have uh, about only 50,000 Catholics altogether. Uh, oh. That would probably be about uh, 35, 40% of the population in the whole area would be Catholic. Uh, also, we uh, were about 80% Indigenous or Métis. So okay. the vast majority of our diocese is Cree. We also have a large group of Dene and some Oji Cree and Métis. Right. And do you have priests in all 50 parishes? No. We have uh, about 19 priests all together. So several, most of them are serving more than one community. So there's a lot of a lot of traveling, not, not just for the Archbishop. Right. There's a lot of travel. Our travel budget is unfortunately huge, usually. So. Right. Now, um, the whole world is self-isolated right now. You're a, 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 you have communities that are isolated by geography anyway. Um, is it true that there are much less cases? What are the statistics for coronavirus up in your region? Something that we're paying attention to daily, of course. And so uh, Manitoba has uh, so far been pretty positive. We only have three cases that I know of, uh, okay. two in Flin Flon and mm -hmm. another in Thompson. Other than that, in our community so far, we don't know of any here in the PAR or in any of our other communities. Okay. Uh, in Saskatchewan, there was an early uh, healthcare worker that came into South End community, and that's uh, maybe uh, two people who definitely, and maybe two more uh, were um, COVID there. And uh, now just recently in our community of Laloche, there again, health worker, uh, there has been um, some uh, COVID there. I think there are six cases now. Right. So area of concern. Right now, uh, but are the restrictions that have applied, let's say, to the whole province of Manitoba or the whole province of Saskatchewan are also the same restrictions that you are under in terms of self-isolation or quarantine or, or limited uh, public gatherings, that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I, there would be some that would be the same and some that might be even a bit stricter. Oh, yeah? I think that uh, one of the things is that because we are out in the bush, that uh, people are still hunting a fair amount and fishing uh, right. these things, uh, which I think is healthy and they can do it in a safe way. So those are, I think, positive parts of being in small communities in the north. Mm -hmm. We also are quite isolated in many of our places. So some of our communities have been, I think, very strict in that they have uh, closed the road in 
Uh, they're not letting anybody just coming in and out. If anybody comes from another community, they're uh, the two week quarantine. Uh, also, there's um, uh, like South End right away moved all their elders into a, a, a separate facility and bringing food and that and being very cautious about who comes and goes to see the elders in any contact. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, our northern communities have been taking it very seriously. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of reasons for that. Um, I think one is that we value elders a lot. I was going to say elders are you know, really important for us. And this, we realize, is this particular threat to our knowledge keepers, our elders. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of our community is taking it very seriously. Another issue is our health care in the north, that we are limited in sort of certainly having ventilators. So there's concern there. And then just our overcrowded housing. Mm. Some of our communities you'll come into and you'll say, oh, there's not that many houses here but there'll be 14 people in a small house. And right. so you can imagine COVID and that in a, in a household like that. So for all those reasons, uh, I think our people have been very cautious and careful. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, how about the young people? I know that there are challenges with young people in the Northern regions with suicide and, and addictions. Uh, is that being affected? Is it worse? Is it maybe better? That's a good question. We have had some suicide in the last uh, uh, couple of weeks. Um, I'm not sure that we're noticing a dramatic difference. Uh, I think there's some positives that are coming from sort of the quietening down and the family time, um, but there's obviously some challenges as well. So um, I don't think that part is changing too much uh, one way or the other so far. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, and you've told me this before when we've spoken about just, you, you spend so much time traveling, it's very difficult for you to go from one part of the diocese to another. Now you're connected through the internet. So that, that maybe is a challenge, but also is giving you, are you finding that it's providing you with different opportunities? I think so. I, we. Uh, we say that our normal attendance at the cathedral might be 250, 300 people in a Sunday in Saturday night mass. And now there's uh, over a thousand watching anyway. So right. uh, there's yeah. more attendance in that sense. Uh, and so we have been trying the live streaming in many of our small communities have been able to do that. Some of our places have local TV or radio stations. And so they've been putting services and prayers on there. Great. Uh, these Wednesdays, uh, we're having a live rosary. We're inviting people to bring prayer intentions uh, to us and that we're gonna just, whoever joins us, pray a, a rosary together in our different indigenous languages. Uh, that just kind of helps the sense of being together in this and uh, right. you know, prayer for it. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so normally you would not be live streaming mass. I know you started live streaming from the cathedral. Tell me about that experience or what maybe first prompted you to actually take that step? Well, I think just the frustration of not being able to hold Sunday public services, eh, uh, that is, I was saying that I never dreamt in my uh, ever that I would be canceling Sunday passes. I know, I know. Uh, I think every bishop in Canada on the world has really struggled with that. Uh, so it just is, what can we do? In, with the cards that were dealt today, how do we make the best of it? And mm -hmm. so I think that's what we're all trying to do. Did you, can I ask you, did you struggle with that limitation about canceling masses? Did you feel that maybe because you, where you are and because there's so few cases that maybe you could relax that? Are, are churches closed completely or are just Sunday masses canceled? How did you, how, how did you find the right balance? That's a delicate issue and uh, not one that's been done without some struggles. Uh, yep. So yes, there's been some people thinking, well, we're in the north, you know, we're a different reality. But like I mentioned the earlier about the concerns for our elders and things that we didn't want to not take it serious. And we also, uh, you know, see ourselves as part of Canada as a whole and we want to do our part. I, I've often said, I never would have dreamt that TSN had nothing to report on. <laughs> and if the juggernaut financial piece that is sports in the world has shut down, 
then the church needs to do its part too. So, so this was all part of our, our mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of coming to grips with it. Mm -hmm. Certainly there's been some, you know, trying to figure out how do we still maintain some spiritual support and still do it in a safe way with COVID-19 now. So there, there's been some attempts like uh, on Saturday evening of Easter Vigil, we invited people to put a lit candle in their window so yeah. that would be um, a symbol of our, our Christ the light coming into our world still. And mm -hmm. uh, so that was one, one example. I'd say where we're getting hit the most difficult for us in the North is funerals. Uh, my heart goes out to Nova Scotia and to the, what they're going through right now. I, we experienced a little of that in Lalash a few years ago, and it's so difficult for the whole community. And it just is a reminder that funerals are very important. They really are part of the community grieving, making peace with things. So they're very important. In the North, our funerals are quite different than the South. So one of the pieces would be that in some of our cultures, there is two to four nights of wake. Normally wow. the body is in a home and it's never left alone. Somebody's always there praying with them. Often a fire is lit. And so a sacred fire is kept and that fire is kept burning through all the wake time until the actual burial. So uh, those symbols are really important. And, and because our communities, even maybe there's 2000 people, they pretty well know each other and are connected. So virtually everyone will go to a wake service. Most of our places will kiss the forehead of the body, will make a sign of the cross on the forehead. Um, these are our important symbols of sort of making peace with the passing of a person. Obviously right. all of that is aside right now. Another example is even in our communities during regular time, if there's a funeral, the school closes, okay. the, the store closes during the time of the funeral. That's how important uh, the funeral service is. So, um, wow. so this is really hitting the north on funerals. It's difficult grieving time. Right. So, but just to clarify, are the churches closed completely for all services or only for Sunday mass and large gatherings? Any gathering over 10 is not allowed. Okay. So we have what we call sometimes a private uh, gathering for a weekday mass, as long as it's under 10. Uh, we do leave our churches open for part of the day for people to come and pray in a okay. physical distancing way. Uh, but we've been very cautious about not having any larger groups. Yeah, because I was thinking in some parishes, maybe on a daily mass, there would be maybe only five parishioners that show up anyway or less. Right. Um, in, in our case, uh, when we first started, Cardinal Collins said no Sunday mass, but weekday mass was okay. And of course, as soon as that Monday came, everybody came to Monday mass and we had to turn people away. So I, I know that that's a difficulty. Um, yeah. But I think there's been growing pains for everyone and we've never had to cope with this type of situation no. before. And so, yeah, it, it's been a bit of a learning process and, you know, we some trial and error. Yeah. Now, for, for those of us here in the South um, that we're so, and I'm going to say this carefully, but I think we're a little spoiled. We get the Eucharist. I can get the Eucharist every day if I want to at any number of churches around here. Maybe in some of your communities, they do not have access to the Eucharist. Have you found the same kind of, uh, I'm not going to say complaints, but, you know, struggles with people uh, uh, um, push, pushing back against this limitation about not being able to receive the Eucharist every Sunday? People have certainly been asking for it, but I, uh, there's been generally an understanding that the reasons why there's concern. Okay. And so there hasn't been a super strong push, certainly in the, the last while. Uh, again, we um, are, I, what I notice is that people are saying things like, I kind of took for granted the be able, being able to gather for, yes. for Mass. I took for granted being able to receive communion. I'm not going to take it for granted now. And uh, so those kind of things, maybe a bit of the positive side of this time of fasting, yeah, I think so. I think we're finding that here as well. And in fact, I tell my parishioners, think of the people in the North that don't have access to the Eucharist all the time. Yes. Um, 
so so in that sense, I guess we're we're in some sort of communion with you uh, together. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Easter Vigil because I know in some places uh, we were actually told to not have the sacred fire, to not do the candle lighting. Obviously, in the, it was not open to parishioners, so if, if pastors were going to do it, they were going to do it on their own. You were able to live stream it from the cathedral. I don't know how many people were there, but you certainly had at least a cantor and some readers and, and some priests with you. But you you were able to do the sacred fire, and I really appreciated being able to watch it because we didn't have it. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me a bit about that and, and, and how important that is for your community. Yes, uh, we, the Easter Vigil was able to have with seven people uh, that we did decide to have the sacred fire because it is such a powerful symbol in the north. Uh, often you need certain basic skills to survive. In the north, it's the ability to make fire any place, anywhere. As long as you're able to make a fire, you're going to be okay, no matter how cold a January day it is or how dark. So the fire symbol is just really important to us. It's mm -hmm. practical. So uh, the sacred fire of Easter is really strong for us. So mm -hmm. is holy water. The guy Tue, it's called in Dene. Okay. But our people are very focused uh, on those um, tangible uh, pieces, expressions of our faith. Okay. And so we will often bless three large uh, barrels of holy water in a community and it'll be all gone. Right. So holy water is a very important piece. So this year we did it by <laughs> blessing the socially unjust individual bottles that were <laughs> not uh, sort of able to be contaminated and uh, pass those out. So just meant uh, that our symbols that really mean to, to things to us, um, that we can still find creative ways to have them there. Right. Um, I know that in communities like yours, you said most of your, your parishioners are indigenous. Um, there's a great relationship between the Catholic Church and the indigenous communities, the indigenous leaders. There's a great sense of enculturation of the faith. And I think that for, for some of us is, is difficult to understand, but I'm curious to know how, uh, what conversations you've been having with indigenous leaders and how they respond to a crisis like this that I would presume is very different than the way we would respond. Main challenge has been that our elders want to have services. Uh, and so it became sort of a support of the chief and councils in trying to respect the health authority in the area. Okay. And so it was just trying to work through some of that with the leadership. And again, our our leaders are facing this for the first time. So we just try to support each other. And we kept saying, respect the local health authority and the local community leaders. Uh, you know, that those are the ones we're working with. From a cultural point of view, uh, maybe the indigenous people that are not Christian, is there any difference in how they respond or how they would, you know, what are they saying about what's happening in the world? They're always, you're wondering, why is this happening? Uh -huh. What is the creator trying to teach us through this? So those kind of questions I think we're all asking uh, to have a sense of uh, what is being graced through this difficult time. So. Right, yeah, and that, and that makes sense. I think a lot of people also have been seeing how this in a ir ironic way is actually a good thing for the environment, for, mm -hmm. for creation um, in terms of pollution and, 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 other, and consumerism even. Um, we, we can't, uh, you know, and, and we would say that God makes all things new and, and we're always able to find good things out of uh, not so great things that are happening. I'm wondering where Archbishop Murray Chatlin is is finding hope. Maybe there's a particular devotion or practice that you normally do or that you've started doing that's actually helping you feed your soul while you try your best to feed the souls of your congregation. Hmm. I don't know if others are experiencing that, but I'm definitely personally on a bit of a roller coaster in that some days I get up and uh, I'm just frustrated. What am I supposed to do today? I would normally have this, I look at my date book and all the things I had planned to go on. So there's part of me that's sort of got those frustrations and impatience. Plus we're living with the same people. There's five of us that live together in a 
uh, uh, the bishop's house here. And, and right. so it's great to have that community, but like, you know, sometimes when you're living together for a while, the blinking of the other person begins to get on your nerves. So, you know, those things I experience. Right. At the same time, I also see some of the blessings. First, don't mind that there's not as much meetings going on. <laughs> so I'm happy uh, often that they're less yeah. so. Um, I do enjoy visiting our community. So I, I do miss that uh, mm -hmm. chance to to be on uh, in the communities and encounter our people, but uh, but there is a chance for me to uh, to sort of quieten down more, uh, to be a little more relaxed uh, uh, about the day in general, and uh, I find that's very helpful for me as kind of a bishop uh, moving around a lot, often uh, trying to get things done. So so personally, it's a struggle, but. I can see that it, there's positives to it as well. I think all of us are wondering, how long, oh Lord, how long does this go on? Right. Uh, but uh, patience is a very important gift. I think we think of the desert fathers and, you know, we're all called to be a little more of the desert fathers or mothers at this time. Right, right. Are you able to, I guess you're able to still go outside, go for walks and spend a lot of time in nature um without being too close to other people i suppose that's still okay for you to do right yeah i think that again uh, with our people that if it's done safely to be mm -hmm. out on the land to, to do some hunting and fishing and and the things that are normal for our people to uh, feed their families and things that these things are still important to do in a safe way yeah you just made me think of one other practical question because you mentioned about feeding the families that you still rely I know that there's a lot of families that that hunt and fish but you still rely on groceries a lot of that that food comes from the south is it is that being have, have prices gone up is there a, a lack of supplies or is that a challenge that you're going through please don't come north to try to get your toilet paper uh, <laughs> we're still uh, in a similar situation to you there there is uh, I think they made some real efforts to try to have as much uh, of the uh, support of food and other things as possible uh, and we haven't found it too dramatic yet uh, there's certainly some empty shelves at times and uh, and areas but it it hasn't been where we're we're really um, uh, wondering what will be next week uh, so uh, there'd be some shortages but uh, it hasn't been too bad i think for our, our people the country foods, they call it, uh, those are really important that uh, we still are eating the wild meat and fish. And things. I guess you're happy about gas prices going down for sure. <laughs> it is uh, a benefit there. What were we saying though, that my vehicle gets three weeks on a gallon of gas right now, because we're not driving anywhere. I so, know. Uh, uh, so, so that is one of the pluses. I know. Maybe just in closing, our bishop, do you want to leave our viewers with your prayer for them, your your hope for them? What is what do you pray for your people and for our viewers? What is your hope for them? I think that we definitely are keeping everybody in prayer, especially the tensions and things that sort of build our funerals. You know, the, the burials that are going on without a full funeral and grieving time. <laughs> Those things were, were really lifting people up. I wanted to uh, just kind of share too that uh, we have had a lot of people come visit the North with youth groups and other things. Uh, obviously that's not happening right now, right. but just that that's something that, that's been a very positive our, for people in the South to experience a bit of our, in Canada, our very different culture. So yeah. I just was going to quote from uh, one of the young men that came up to do a youth uh, visit. He says, the mission to Black Lake was a much needed excursion for me for my everyday life and took me out of the selfish bubble I had slowly been putting myself into. The Dene people have such beautiful faith and generosity, unlike anything I had been experiencing before. Meeting with the kids, playing volleyball, hockey, and other sports with them was a great experience just being with them. So many good conversations and interaction. Praying with one another and face-to-face -face youth group encouraging personal prayer was a big highlight for me in the trip. 
And I truly can say that although I came prepared to give, I receive much more. And I guess just that some of this movement, when we're able to move again, of visiting the North and uh, uh, communities uh, speaking of the North and the South, I think there's some real graces and benefits that can happen with that once we're sort of past uh, the quarantine. Yes, good. That's that's a good advice for, for all of us. I'll take you up on that because I'm still waiting to go up and visit you. Um, okay. when this is all over. I, I'll certainly be up there, but I'll come in the summer so we can go canoeing together. That, that sounds great. Sounds great. All right. So I just want to express that uh, all over Canada, I think there's been some real creativity in trying to respond to the challenges that are there. Uh, one of the issues has been masks and that we're not supposed to be using medical masks uh, because they need them on the front lines. And okay. so trying to make homemade masks and things like that have been uh, kind of a new industry. And so in the north, one of our responses is that every household has something that is kind of a, pr a protective uh, uh, outfit for us that can be very positive. And so I was just going to show you what we've been oh. using for our uh, uh, protection lately here. <laughs> so we've got the uh, skidoo There's mask uh, set up and it also benefits us if we slip on the ice or whatever there. So Wonderful. I'm going for groceries now. We'll see you later. Wonderful. That's great. We should start doing that here too. Archbishop Murray Chatlin, it's so good to see you and to speak with you and to hear your words of inspiration um, and guidance for us today. Okay. Thank you, Deacon Pedro. Archbishop Murray Chatlin is the Archbishop of Kiwetan Le Pa in the north of Canada, and he spoke to us from his office in the Pa, Manitoba. And that's all for now. Thank you for being with us. Remember to continue visiting our website, saltandlighttv.org, for more articles and videos during this time of pandemic. Stay safe, stay blessed, and may you find faith during this time of crisis. Thank you.